All right. Thank you everyone for attending. I know people will slowly start coming in. What I'm going to do is share my screen really quick. That will show you the agenda um, and what we are going to cover today. I'm gonna to put your lovely faces over here so I can see you on this side. Um, so um, thank you all. Can you see my screen? Great, awesome. Thank you all for attending. Um, and as always, this is recorded for anyone that is missing, um, that will be missing, or if you want to share this information with anyone within your, your organization that you think the information would be really important for them to, uh, to understand and listen to, okay? So um, this is the agenda for today. Quick roll call. Some of you are already doing it, putting down your name, the agency you're from. I'm going to have Pooja introduce herself. Very important person for you all to meet. I do see that Pooja is here. Very excited for that. Um, we'll have Portland State University um, go over a couple of evaluation um, topics, things for you all to be updated and anything else like that that's important to use this time for. I will go over current equity fund data, how many we, are, we have served to date. Um, kind of look at the quick demographics, look at the paraeducation component as well. I will go over the equity deliverables. Um, these are the equity deliverables that are in the grant agreement, grant manual, and then give you some very important reminders. Um, but one very important that I'm going to actually state right now, and we'll state again in a little bit, the importance of the grant survey that's due this Friday. Please, 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 please. That one is crucial, okay? And so thank you, everyone. Excited to see all the names. Excited to see everyone. Uh, next, we are going to move and have Pooja. Oh, these are all the grantees. Hoping to see someone from every organization here. Like I said, there are about a couple. There's two that have informed me that they won't be able to attend today. But as always, recorded. So anyone missing can uh, watch this later. And then next on the agenda, is we will have Pooja introduce herself. I'm going to stop sharing the screen so we all can see Pooja and um, get to know Pooja and kind of understand why she's an important person to the equity fund. And so let me go about getting to my control functions. Now, where is it? I have no idea where it went now. Let's see, there it is. Let me stop sharing screen. Should I just go ahead, Kimberly, while you fiddle with that? Okay, <laughs> I would love to see, share a screen um, for a few slides if possible, if you get that figured out, but I understand oh. technology, great. <laughs> yeah, um, let me give you the, the option to be able to share screen. Wonderful, thank you. Um, before I do that, hello everybody. Um, I know a few of you get to see you again. Um, I'm Pooja Bhatt, I use she, her pronouns, and I am a consultant. Um, who supports a lot of different organizations. And the reason that I'm here today is because I'm supporting the Early Childhood Equity Collaborative. Um, and I'm really excited to be here to meet you all and to um, tell you a little bit about the Early Childhood Equity Collaborative. And really the, the takeaway is really inviting new partnerships with many of you here if we um, don't already work together. Hi, Danita, I just saw you pop in as well. <laughs> Um, I have had a chance to work with several organizations here, but we know that the Equity Fund benefits many organizations throughout the state. Um, and I'll share a little bit about the Equity Collaborative, but, but first I wanna share a little bit about myself and who I am um, and allowing you to come into my space. I feel like that's only fair. Um, so I live in the Portland um, area in Southeast Portland, outer Southeast. Um, I'm originally from the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area, um, a small town um, that wasn't great to grow up in, but it gave me an early understanding of how racial equity could show up and what it really doesn't look like when it shows up. And the impact that it has on young children and families um, was really clear to me when I saw nobody who looked like me in my preschool. Um, and the impacts of that really sticks with me today and I'm almost 40. So, um, so my why is really just growing up in an Indian American household with immigrant parents, with a grandfather who um, fought against British colonial rule and was jailed um, 
and, and marched alongside Gandhi, those types of values and principles um, are very key to who I am as a person. And my, my career started um, working in the labor movement, uh, working in Portland, then working in India with low income security guards. And I tell a lot of folks that I had a pre midlife crisis at the 20 some odd years after working in India, I said, I talk to a lot of security guards who tell me that the reason that they're working in these jobs is really just to get their kids to school. Um, because in India, you have to pay tuition just to send your children to public school. And they really wanted a better life for themselves. So I said, there's organizing is great um, in the labor movement, but what else can I do to make social change happen? And I got really interested in um, policy change because from my lens, policy change can really be a way to dismantle the inequities that we see in our systems today. And my belief from my 20 year career working in labor movement, working with education organizations, um, many different types of culturally specific organizations is that we can talk a lot about change. We can have all of the racial equity trainings that we want to have, but at the end of the day, we need people to be able to understand our really messed up racist systems in state government and local government, um, in all types of government and in business and philanthropy, and to be able to have enough insight about the problems and the systems so that we know how to address them. Because I find so many times really well-meaning organizations and institutions ask communities of color for their opinion about what changes should be made, but the government entities have not typically done the work of informing communities about just how messed up these systems are and how interconnected they are. And so we end up going to parents and families and say, what are your priorities? They're gonna talk in terms of their own language, what they see every day in terms of access to people who look like them, trainings that are culturally relevant and responsive, but they, they won't necessarily use the same type of language that state government and policymakers often use. So that's really the point of the Early Childhood Equity Collaborative is to kind of solve for this problem that we often see of government agencies kind of asking for tables. And I'm not picking on the state because I think everybody could raise their hand and say they have been part of a, a table where a well-meaning dominant culture institution has said, we want to convene a community groups for community engagement, but they don't typically resource the community organizations. They don't build capacity. They don't fund staff to come to the tables to provide input on behalf of their organizations. So the Early Childhood Equity Collaborative was really formed to kind of flip the script about how community engagement works. Instead of culturally specific organizations being asked to come to dominant culture's table and do everything on the agenda and timeline of dominant culture organizations and government, we've created our own table of culturally specific organizations who are working in early childhood to self-determine what we want policy solutions to be. And then we're gonna go work with government and um, ally organizations to get them to really understand the importance of what, why our policy priorities are what they are, and then they can use their privilege to advance our priorities. That's kind of the theory of the Early Childhood Equity Collaborative. But um, before I open it up for conversation, I just wanna share some background. I may have said some of this. So these are the organizations that you see on your screen um, that are currently funded partners in the Early Childhood Equity Collaborative, Black Parent Initiative, ERCO, Kairos PDX, Latino Network, NEA, and PACUN. Um, why did the collaborative form? So about three years ago, the early, the, these partners came together um, and said there's really a lack of systemic statewide investment in culturally specific services that benefit the early childhood communities in our state. Um, there was initial effort by some culturally specific organizations and I think in the 2017 state legislative session um, that they weren't able to get the equity fund passed. Fast forward to a couple of years later, these organizations went to philanthropy and said, we need funding to be able to 
to have the time as staff and culturally specific organizations to work with PSU, who, who I see is here, and Oregon Community Foundation, and the state government, and the governor's policy advisor for early learning, um, to get them to understand why the equity fund is important. So it's really this these partners who it, the conditions were made possible with funding for, for philanthropy for these organizations to ultimately get the early childhood equity fund passed in law. Um, and that was a lot of partnership, not just the collaborative, but partnering with organizations like PSU who's here, who was able to take that concept and really build the research base behind it because we all know that policymakers in Salem tend to listen to researchers more than they listen to black and brown communities who are saying, this is what we know for a long time. Mm -hmm. So in the scheme of things, the equity fund is really great, but this, this is outdated now. And this is for the 2019-21 session, but we put this together right after that session because we were fighting at the beginning of the pandemic just to keep the equity fund whole, because even though it had just passed, we were we were under a constant threat um, that because of the, the budget situation early on in the pandemic, that that might need to have to be cut. But you can see this red little sliver was the overall piece of the pie of the Student Success Act. So the point is that the equity fund is great. It started to make movement for culturally specific funding in early childhood. But the big picture is that we need to do much more than just to have the early childhood equity fund to continue to build on what the state has already done and what partners like us around the table have already pushed for to continue to find the ways with within the early childhood sector that we can build more equity in. Um, so my ask to you all is really, are you interested in kind of collaborating um, with the group that I mentioned earlier um, in one of these two areas? One is that we're doing an um, initiative where we're talking to staff in your organizations or parents to be um, to be able to tell us well, why are culturally specific programs like the Equity Fund important. And we're using that as a launch pad to understand what other issues that they're seeing on the ground that can help to inform a policy agenda for the next session. And this comes along with um, 150 visa gift cards for the staff and families who talk to us, as well as a small stipend for your organization to, to be able to help this, this part of the work. So that's more around story and interviews and is a more short-term um, thing to participate. And then this one is more of a long-term, um, but it could be short-term if you want to. We're really flexible. Um, is if your organization or if you as staff wanna help to create policy changes, um, we have meetings where we currently gather our partners and we can um, begin to work with you on um, getting your input on the policy changes. But, um, there's a lot more that I could say, but my ask is that if you're interested, you know, scan this QR code, goes to a survey link, or um, or you can, I'll send this and I'll put this in the chat and you can just fill out this interest form. It's just an interest form. So I know if you're interested, I'll follow up with you offline. I'm sorry, I just talked at you. I'm just wondering if there's any questions. I have one, and Olivia here. Um, um, yes, I'm on that on that steering committee. But um, what I was wondering, I'm still trying to grasp, is how do you see this different than um, than the one that that we're in the OPEJ that I'm in with Foundations for Better Oregon, Amanda Latino Network. Well, Amanda's done an amazing job, but. A lot of nonprofits of color all over the, the state. You know what I mean? I think you've been there, right, Pooja? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So, so what's different or what yeah. do we, we interact? Are we repeating something? Do we need to do it together? Yeah, so OPEJ has been predominantly focused on K-12 and the equity collaborative is predominantly focused on the early learning world. And oh, we know okay. that there, okay. we know that there are intersections, but for example, I'm sorry if this is too in the weeds for some of you, but um, future uh, foundations for a better Oregon is kind of, um, 
functionally in some ways the equivalent of the Children's Institute, if, if some of you are familiar with them. Children's Institute's a large organization that's got a lot of research and policy and communications capacity to support the early childhood world. And Foundations of a Better Oregon is um, similar capacity on the K-12 role. They both convene their own coalitions. The, right. the, the Early Childhood Equity Collaborative is actually moving in the direction where Children's Institute would be our backbone in the same way that the Foundations for a Better Oregon is the backbone for the OPEJ coalition. So right. there's a lot of cross Which was before Chalkboard Project, as we know that with right. that whole thing. Yeah, K through, that makes it good, make good sense. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Are there other questions? Okay. Kimberly, you probably have to go, right, and to the next thing. Yeah, um, but I, I wanted to mention, you know, there's many of you that I check in during, you know, our uh, monthly or bi-monthly check-ins, and many of you are like, who can we connect with to share the stories, you know, like the impacts of the equity fund, you know, um, Pooja, Pooja is the one. OK, <laughs> you know, like many have said, is there a place where we can send a letter? Can we go in front of the legislature and talk about what the impacts and get more funding for the equity fund? Many of you have asked. And here she is. OK, and so please connect with Pooja. The forms is on there. Uh, Pooja, can you put your email as well, too, just in case so they can email you? Many have really asked for that. Please connect with her. We are really wanting more additional funding for the equity fund. This is. Uh, um, you know, I work at the ELD, so I can't say go, but, you know, individuals, you know, advocates um, are able to. So please connect and share those stories and the impacts of the equity fund. We definitely want more than 20 million per biennium. You know, we want more than that. And so uh, definitely um, please share and connect with Pooja if needed. All right. All right. Um, thank you, Pooja. I, uh, PSU, I have given all three of you uh, a co-host access. So I don't know who's sharing um, slides or anything. And so uh, we're going to move on to you. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, I'm going to start. And here we go. So we have a whole bunch of evaluation updates for you today. There's an awful lot going on with the evaluation right now, which is super exciting. So I'm going to start by sharing some updates from the evaluation leadership group and the evaluation design process. Then Alexis is going to share the results of the data collection tool survey that we recently did. And then Amber is going to talk a bit about the upcoming grantee interviews that you'll all be invited to participate in. So starting with the evaluation design process, your colleagues on the leadership team have been working really hard over the last couple of months to specify exactly what we want to learn from this evaluation. So this slide here shows the broad areas of outcomes that we have been working to identify. So including ESEF benefits for children, caregivers, and families, how families are experiencing ESEF programs, and the extent to which families are defining and meeting their own goals. So those are the major areas of outcomes that we have identified so far. For the process study piece, we also have been working to identify what do we really wanna learn here? And so this slide is outlining all of the different pieces, again, that we have identified as being of interest to the evaluation. So what are the characteristics of culturally specific early learning services? What are the ESEF benefits for grantees, both organizationally and also for staff? What impact is ESEF having on broader system change? What barriers are, are families currently facing? And in turn, how are they demonstrating resilience, families and communities? 
And then this really big picture question around the macro level factors that are affecting families, communities, and programs over the course of this project period. So you can see there's a whole list of possible examples that we have brainstormed that might be more or less relevant, right, depending on the community in question. And then we have one more um, area of study that we're continuing to talk about. This is a really big sticky one, right? And this is the question of quality. What does high quality mean when it comes to culturally specific services? Where do we see overlap with white dominant understandings of quality? Again, currently within the early learning system and where there might be differences and where we might wanna bring back those insights to the white dominant system so that that system indeed can do its own learning. So this one, like I said, is still kind of under process because um, it is such a sticky one. So now that the group has um, identified these areas that we want to be focusing on for the evaluation, we're moving into the next phase of our process here. So this is the graphic that you've seen a number of times now that um, outlines our overall sort of cyclical iterative process for the evaluation. And we're moving now into this um, phase that we call prioritize. And this is where we start to identify possible data and data collection tools that could be used to inform each one of these areas of inquiry that we have identified. So we just kicked off this process by sharing with the evaluation leadership group the findings that emerged from the survey that we did with you all around the data collection tools that you are currently using. And like I said, Alexis is gonna share that information back with you all here um, in just a minute. So at the same time um, that we are working on identifying the possible data collection tools, we're also starting our own round of interviews with each of the grantees around the characteristics of the culturally specific early learning services. So Amber is gonna likewise um, do some more orientation to all of us to that process today and what to expect there. So try to be super quick so that I can um, make more time for Amber and Alexis to share more detail, but just to pause for a minute and see if there are any questions or comments. I have a question. Will the evaluators be coming on site to do any type of observations or anything like that? Because sometimes it's difficult to express verbally what a culturally specific program and how it differs from a normal program, at least it is for me. Um, but it's easier for you Absolutely. Um, that's a great question. And I think it is something that we need to talk about again with the evaluation leadership group to see if that seems feasible. I mean, if it were at all, um, it seems like a great idea to me. All right, well, why don't I stop sharing and I can hand it over to Alexis. I'm gonna um, put a chat real quick with a link to the um, presentation in Spanish if anybody wants to use that. Okay, so as Lorelai mentioned, I'm gonna be walking through the results of the data collection tool survey. Um, and just as a quick reminder, we were hoping that the survey would help us um, understand a bit what data you're using so that um, you don't have to do a lot of additional work to participate in the evaluation. Uh, 23 out of 26 grantees completed the survey, so we wanted to thank you all so much for your participation. 
The survey was split up in child level data questions and family level data questions. We're going to start with child level. Um, we asked you all um, whether or not you collected data based on certain child level um, categories. So this first one you can see here at the bottom of the graph, we asked general child development um, and whether or not you collected data or not. So um, for this first category, we saw the blue is a yes response. The orange is a no, we do not collect uh, data related to general child development. And then silver is not sure. So we saw that more than half of grantees collect data related to developmental status and social emotional development. Uh, we saw that more than half of grantees collect data related to early literacy and numeracy. And if you have any questions, um, please feel free to chat them in chat or just let me know. We saw that fewer programs collect data related to early literacy in languages other than English. About half of programs collect data related to child health and access to services. And most programs collect data related to child, racial, ethnic, linguistic pride, and identity. We then asked whether grantees used any standardized tools to collect child level data, and we saw that close to half of grantees did. Um, those that indicated yes, in this table here, you can see which tools um, were mentioned most across grantees. The ASQ was the, um, came in at number one with six, followed by the TS Gold and the Parenting Ladder. Close to half of grantees also used tools that their program developed. And we also saw that more than three quarters of grantees engage in other child level data collection. In this table, you can see those other ways of collecting child level data with observation um, being the highest response, followed by pictures, conversations, and so on. The frequency of child level data collection varied a lot across programs and type of data collected. Um, this table again shows that monthly was the highest response um, all the way down to twice or daily, uh, depending on the type of data that was collected. About half of grantees collect program satisfaction data or feedback on child level services, often in multiple ways. Um, yeah, we saw in this one that lots of grantees uh, collected data in this uh, program satisfaction data in multiple ways. Uh, family surveys, surveys and informal conversation with families were uh, the highest that we saw. So now we're going to switch focus here a little bit on the family level data. We asked uh, similar questions uh, related to family level data categories. Um, so again, the graph is the same as last. Blue is a yes response, uh, orange is a no response, and a silver is a not sure response. Um, so from this um, data, we can see that many grantees collect data related to positive family indicators. More than half of grantees collect data related to parental knowledge, confidence, and parent-child interaction. Relatively few grantees collect data related to parental, uh, physical, and mental health while more track services, uh, track access to services. And you can see the um, you know, specific percentages for each of these categories. Right. Most grantees collect data related to parental, racial, ethnic, linguistic pride and identity and collection, connection to community. Lastly, slightly more than half of grantees collect parent slash family level data on uh, parent English language skills. Uh, just like the child level data, we asked whether um, grantees collect standardized, use standardized tools to collect family level data. Um, for this question, we saw that parenting skills ladder was the highest response, followed by the perceived stress scale and the protective factor survey. 
almost two thirds of grantees also use the tool to develop, um, also use the tool that the program developed to collect family level data. And more than two thirds of grantees engage in other ways of collecting family level data. Um, yeah, this table is pretty similar to the uh, child level data um, with conversations and pictures and videos um, being most widely used. The frequency of family level data collection varies across programs and tools as well. And somewhat more than a third of grantees collect program satisfaction data or feedback on family level services, just like um, the last family surveys and informal conversations um, were the highest. Thank you all. So that was the data that we um, collected and some of the uh, preliminary findings that we found. Um, does anyone have any questions? All right, thank you all. Um, I'm gonna now pass it on to Amber. Hey everybody, let me um, just share my screen here. Okay. So, um, we want to have conversations with you all, and um, we're going to be reaching out about these conversations. And so this is just an opportunity for us to explain kind of what we're looking to do and to get feedback from you and to answer any questions so that, um, uh, yeah, so that you're prepared to um, enter into these conversations with us. Um, so who will be participating? We are inviting all grantees to participate. Um, however, we wanna stress that this is not a requirement of your grant that you participate in this session. Um, and, you know, and at the same time, we believe that these conversations will help immensely in not only helping us to evaluate these programs, but also to, you know, to further this work that Pooja is talking about in terms of really expressing to their early childhood system why your programs are important. So we would love if you would all participate as much as possible. Um, we are able to talk to you as an individual or as you go through this session and you think, oh, somebody else at my organization might be you know, might have some more information or might want to join me on this conversation, we are happy to accommodate any um, things like that. And um, most of these interviews will be conducted by either myself or Alexis. And so we are looking at doing these listening sessions for about 60 to 90 minutes. And Right now, the idea is over Zoom, but just thinking and hearing Zakia, you know, bring up this idea of how difficult it is to show, to, you know, explain in words necessarily what you all are accomplishing. Um, we're open, I think, at this point to discussing if there's another format that might work best for you. Um, our idea is that we would kind of do an introduction to the research. Um, you would have to participate in a consent to participate. And then we have a list of about six questions that we've developed that we're gonna go over today and that we would um, talk through with you. Um, we're looking at doing this work in April through June. And um, as a thank you or honorarium for your time, we're able to provide a $25 gift card um, in thanks. And we also wanna hear from you if there's any other kind of um, accommodations that you would need to make the session more accessible um, in, in terms of language or any other types of accommodations. And feel free to just interject if you have any questions as I go through this. 
So these particular conversations are really honed in on that one question. One of the questions are things we want to find out that Lorelai kind of went over, and it's what are the characteristics of culturally specific early learning services? So we want to invite each grantee to meet with us and share with us your program's approach to an understanding of culturally specific early education, um, early childhood education. And, um, and this is something that we would hope to highlight in our upcoming report as a way to inform the field and to um, increase knowledge about this work that you are all doing. Um, again, important notes, um, this is not required and these conversations will be confidential. So your organization and your own leadership in providing this programming is very valuable and the information you share, as we've been saying, will really inform important recommended changes to policy and practice at the state level in support of your programming. But we um, want you to know that whatever you share will be kept confidential in terms of it won't be identifiable. So we will take the information and absolutely um, be very careful if there are certain proprietary information that you wouldn't want us to share, you know, please be aware that we're able to kind of keep that confidential. And we'll, we would just, you know, really summarize this information and share this out to the ELD. Um, in our report, we wouldn't use your name, your position, or your organization's name in this um, outward facing document. Um, so now I just wanted to go over the questions that we have developed. Um, we'll share this information with you and anybody else participating in the conversation prior to our meeting with you. Um, no, we don't expect written answers to these questions. Um, it'd be great if you and your team kind of reviewed them ahead of time and kind of thought through a little bit of what you might want to bring to the table, but we are not looking for written essays or anything of that source of sort. And um, the questions might change a little bit as we go, as we talk to people and we kind of flesh out, okay, this makes more sense to ask this question in a certain way or whatnot. So just kind of putting that caveat in there. And also if you have, if you all have any input on, you know, phrasing of the question to make it more accessible or appropriate to your programs, we're happy to kind of talk through that as well. So this is one of the first questions we would ask is what does the term culturally specific mean to you and your program? Um, why are these aspects important? Um, and really delving into are there understanding, understandings of childhood or child re rearing in your community that are reflected in the design of your program that may be different for your specific culture or community? Um, we want to ask you to kind of paint a picture of your program in action, you know, give us some tangible elements that you would identify and define as culturally specific. It could go from any, from, from the goals of your program, you know, around uh, connecting with culture or, you know, identity or something else to how you staff your programming, your approaches to working with children and families, how you set up your classroom environment, um, the rituals or materials that you use or that you engage in, um, anything else that you wanna bring to the table. We wanna kind of get a feel from you for like what might be unique about your programming compared to other early childhood programming out there, um, why those unique aspects are important and where there actually might be overlaps with what's happening out there in the field.
And going back to the sticky question that Lorelai mentioned in, in her presentation, you know, how would you define high quality early learning using a culturally specific lens? How do these definitions diverge? Where is their overlap again? And um, I think the Alexis mentioned 87% of grantees, you know, collect some sort of data regarding cultural and linguistic identity development, pride and connection to culture. So, you know, we're asking, do you do this? Are you able to describe to us? Because really in this work, we're trying to, you know, figure out what's already happening in the field and what can, like I said before, kind of help inform and help us really elevate the work that you're doing um, and, you know, describe it. And then our last um, question is really going to be around uh, sharing of materials. So if there are any ways that we can demonstrate what culturally specific early education services looks like, feels like, um, what the experience, you know, kind of bringing that to our, um, our reporting, that would be really um, amazing. For example, photos, um, you know, materials, manuals, assessment tools. Um, we understand there probably will be formal processes for, you know, um, sharing of these materials. Just kind of wanted to throw that out there, kind of talk to you a little bit about it and um, want to emphasize that any materials you share with us would still, you know, 100% belong to the organization. We could talk through, um, what level of kind of public, you know, um, public outward facing mention we could make of the materials and we wouldn't use or reproduce any materials in any of the reports without explicit permission of your organization. Um, and so the result of these conversations are really, you know, again, to inform the evaluation report that we will submit to the ELD and to the legislature. And, um, and we hope that this will inform the field about the important work that you all are doing, you know, support the work of Pooja um, and other culturally specific organizations throughout Oregon. And um, drafts of the report would be shared with you for feedback and you know vetting and adjustments. And again, no identify information, identifiable information would be shared. It would just be findings in aggregate. So any questions or um, recommendations or anything? I have something I'd like to add with the time remaining. Unless somebody else has something to say. I have something I'd like to add if if uh, if no one else is sharing. This is Anna Olivia. Um, it really occurs to me as you were talking, um, we've, I've been participating with the committee and it really occurs to me while you're talking that everything we've been doing and uh, measuring is to show, you know, the community and the traditional community out there that we also have evaluation materials, you know, like traditional um, evidence base, which is all good, we need that. But what, what I'm seeing is that we only have stories to say, how parents and kids are benefiting in ways that are not measured on the little test. And um, that's where culture comes in. So it occurs to me that I would like to do like an interview process or ask a number of parents, like have our staff call a lot of parents and just say, why did you like our program so much? What, what was the most important thing about it? We do hear out loud that it was like, well, because it's in our own language. So that's a big deal. Um, but there's also other things in there. And uh, for other groups of color that speak English, there's, there's some additional components 
And of course, as staff, we think we know what they are, you know, that it's got their own culture, their own language, this type of stuff. But I'll, I would really like to know what more parents might say if we did a lot of little short interviews. And I'd love to have a little help with that, Amber, as uh, we go forward, um, help us as a group um, find other ways to get you the data you need. Yeah, thank you. I feel like this, these conversations with the organizations will really kind of launch ideas and, you know, a whole bunch of things that can kind of stem from that. And, you know, our team is really excited to support the process and the evaluation leadership team to kind of um, think more deeply around those items. So, yeah. Any other questions or suggestions? Um, so Alexis and I will be reaching out to you all. And if you have any questions, please do let us know. Um, we're happy to work with you to figure out what will work best, who's the best person to kind of be a part of these conversations and go from there. Let's see, is that all for today, PSU? That was really good information. <laughs> I've been very excited to hear and see the data. That was my first time seeing the data collection data. And so my mind is like bracing right now <laughs> on like what we can do for supports in the future and what we can and what I'm gonna definitely advocate for. And so um, <clears throat> thank you all for the grantees that participated in that survey. You know, definitely looking forward to, you know, this whole process that you all um, can be a part of at PSU. Um, like what they said, it's not, you know, mandatory, but great information if you can really uh, participate because we at the ELD are always wanting to learn more. And it would be great to have those clear, more clear definitions uh, for us to utilize and, and make it more appropriate, really, for all the communities that we're serving in Oregon. Um, I will go and share my screen again, um, and I'm going to share, can you see the screen that says current program data? Okay, great. Thank you. Jeffrey, I'm always looking at you. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, and I'm like losing my voice. Um, as of today, we have served over 3,000 unduplicated children. You know, and so if you think about that, the goal for the ELD that they have put down is 2,500 unduplicated. And so we have already surpassed that as of February. And that's with a couple of reports not turned in yet and not updated. Um, and that's not including March. You know, obviously the March report is due by the end of this week as well. And so we don't even have a month added in there and we're, we've already surpassed um, the goal. And, and that's just unduplicated. If you were to think about the children that have been receiving services since the beginning of the program year to now, I mean, it, it's way more than that. That is amazing. And then, you know, we asked for parent education data and just to see the unduplicated amount of parents um, um, that are participating, Adina, in my mind, were blown away when we were looking at the data. And so I'm um, going to kind of share with you a little bit of screenshots from our internal database. You know, here's kind of like the age breakdown, the gender breakdown, the relationships with the parents, um, uh, primary, secondary uh, language, FYI, as I have informed you all, the income is not mandatory. So this is just the income information that we have received from the ones that are able to um, give us an income. And so, I mean, looking at that breakdown, I really like how it was really split pretty much kind of even with, you know, females and males, you know, um, other, um, looking at the age breakdown, definitely we're very focused on three to five-year-olds. Makes me think about the little ones that need some loving as well. And so looking at that, looking at you know, the parent relationships, a lot are with the parents. There are some foster parents, legal guardianship and their primary language, you know, English and Spanish secondary English and Spanish are the top two. Um, when we look at the demographic breakdown, 
here are the specific demographic breakdowns as of what has been submitted as of February. Um, and so if you take a look at that, I'll give you guys you know, a minute or two just to kind of look at this information. This is really important information that you know we give to the um, um, DLT team, the leadership team at the ELD. Um, FYI, our program is the program that receives the most comprehensive data, uh, uh, demographic data. And so we ask you all to submit this on a monthly basis to us. Um, as for the other programs, um, they do this, I believe, annually. And so just seeing this information from you all on a monthly basis, I mean, we are the equity fund, so we have to have this information to, to report it. But I mean, it is amazing work that's being done. Okay. And then the next page is the parent education data. You know, as you can see, a lot of females um, over male that are participating in this parent education. So we definitely got to get those, you know, fathers, those males, those grandparents, the foster parents, whoever it is, um, uh, definitely taking a look at that. You know, primary language, you know, English is still the primary, but Spanish is right after. Um, same thing with secondary. Uh, looking at the demographic breakdown, you can see 41% uh, Hispanic, Latino, Latino, you know, 21% Black or African American. The breakdown is all right there of who is participating in the parent education programs. Um, not everyone, not all grantees offer a parent education program, but um, quite a lot of you are. And so um, this is great information that the legislature, um, the, DL, the DLT team requested this year. This is why we were um, asked to get this information from you all this year. And this is great information that we will be sending over uh, to them, that we're, I will send over to them on a monthly basis. Okay, uh, these slides will also, I will also give you access to these slides if you need to take a look at the information a lot more in depth as well. Um, next, I'm going to talk about the equity deliverables. You know, uh, being an equity, uh, being a grantee, uh, being funded through the ELD, you're considered a grantee. Um, every grantee, uh, regardless of your background, whether you are a nonprofit, if you are a child care center, in-home child care center, a school district, uh, ESD, um, there are deliverables in which is in your contract. Um, and this is for all programs from preschool promise, OPK, um, HFO, relief nurseries, equity fund. There are four, um, four tasks that all uh, grantees must complete by the biennium. This is the first year of the biennium. And so we have up until the end of next program year. Um, the first one is the survey in which you all um, were asked at the beginning of the fall last year. Um, there is one grantee that has not completed this and um, I will be connecting with you. You are a grantee that has not completed yet because you have been without the staff, you have finally hired the staff and so I will be connecting with you to complete that. The second one is the equity training. Um, last year, you all gave me um, a list of uh, equity training with all the staff that are under the equity fund, um, the date and time of those, that is what's required per biennium. This biennium is a four hour biennium requirement uh, for an equity fund. So if you have done anything within your agency this year so far that is two hours or already completes the four hours, please send that over to me. It could be a certificate that shows proof of the name of the training. Um, you could give me a list of all the staff that attended it. Um, but the piece behind this is anyone that uh, is a, that is funded through the equity fund must uh, participate in it. And so, uh, or must have, you know, gotten at least four hours of equity training. Equity should be embedded in everything that we do. So it shouldn't technically be uh, mandatory, but sometimes it's a reminder that we're needed to, to um, participate in. I know you all are doing equity training, doing equity procedures and everything that you do, but this is for all programs. So understand that this is a deliverable for all grantees. The third one is a demographic data analysis. And so this is where you all submit a monthly demographic data to, to me and Adina already as compared to the other programs that don't. And so 
Once a year, they are to pull that data and then look at their community and see who is being underserved and how they're going to go about serving their community and the people, the, community, the children that are farthest in need. That is an annual report that they have to complete. Um, but good news is that you all do not need to complete it because Nadina and I have said, you send this information to us every single month. We're not gonna have you waste your time and looking at, you know, pulling demographic data and doing all that again. And so what's fortunate is actually, we've had a long discussion at the ELD about this and they are removing it for all programs right now. Um, just because one, um, as you can see from the data collection um, that PSU did with you all, not everyone um, um, records the information. And so some grantees are as small as a two, person grantee um, and they don't have the capacity and then some are like a 300 people um, uh, organization and so we have to build a structure in which it can be successful and so uh, we are wanting the ELD to, to take a stop and pause and take a look at how we can go about supporting this so that this is meaningful and not just a check mark um, for all of our grantees and so you will or you might have already received a, a, an email um, that indicates you are a grantee and you do not need to complete this. It is now officially taken out for all grantees, okay? So you don't need to do that. And then the fourth one is this is uh, an ELD orientation webinar that someone from your organization has to attend. Uh, it has not been um, offered this year, so it will be offered next year. It will be us going in depth about these deliverables. And so you just have to have someone from your organization next year, once we have the orientation, for someone to sign up and watch the orientation. So someone from your agency will understand what the equity deliverables are for being an ELD grantee. And so that's simply what it is. And so just know that currently you have completed step one already. Um, step two, like I said, if you have already been doing trainings, send any proof. Um, if you don't have a certificate, just send a list of all the staff, the date, uh, the date and name of um, the training, and that is, that will be suffice and just send that to me. And I'm keeping track and putting it in a, um, in a folder in which I report to uh, the DLT team on this. And then, like I said, once that orientation is ready to go from the ELD, we will inform you all and just have someone sign up and be present at the webinar to attend the equity deliverables so they can understand this information more in depth, okay? And so um, that is all. If you have any questions, put in the chat box function and I will read it in a little bit here. And then simply reminders. Um, reminder, ongoing equity fund support sessions, new staff orientation. The next one is next week. I have about two to four people that would be attending. Very exciting, always people attending. And it's really great because it's been around two to four and it's very intimate. We're able, your, the staff have been able to ask questions. If you have any staff that needs to attend, send me their name and say, hey, Kimberly, please sign up our new staff, blah, blah, blah. You don't have to be a new staff. We have, we have some pro, program coordinators that has attended and said, oh my goodness, this was a really good refresher. And oh my goodness, really good to know like the meaning behind the equity fund. Like I had no idea about this. So if you want to attend, if there's any staff members that needs to attend this, please send me an email and just say, please send the, please send the invite to me as well. Okay. There's also reporting TA. If this happens, I always aim for uh, um, like a week or so before reports are due. And so the next one is uh, May, May 3rd, um, that is for the April report. And so if you have any specific questions on the reports, hop on um, and I could uh, help you and give you some PA on what to do with your reports. Um, you all have been doing amazing with your reports. I mean, I, Adia and I have have been talking about it. We're blown out of our minds how amazing you all are. Obviously, the system is in place. You all are understanding the expectations. Like we are trying our best to help you if you have any questions in a timely manner. And so, no one has been attending these, but it is always always available every month for anyone that wants to attend and specifically talk to me. Other than that, we've also been I've been meeting with you one on one on any other um, time that uh, is more available for you as well too. And so. There is that. 
I am going to drop in the chat box function the COVID survey that I sent uh, two weeks ago. It is very important that somebody from your organization completes it because it is um, information that we are having to report to um, OHA. They are the uh, entity that have given us the COVID kits and um, they're kind of, you know, to be completely transparent, kind of worried why, you know, there, there, need, there isn't much of a need. And so if someone can go in from your agency and complete it, so far um, we've received half. And so the other half, please go in, it's four quick, easy questions. I mean, you complete that, can complete it in a couple of minutes. Please go in and complete that survey uh, for us and that would be great. And then lastly, the most important reminder, this Friday, the grant survey is due. Please email it to me and Adina. Okay, um, FYI, if we do not receive one from you by Friday, that is letting us know that you are opting out from being a grantee next year and receiving fundings for your program. And so please have something submitted to us by end of the night, Friday. So we have something in under your agency, have a completed grant survey uh, for funding next year. It is due this Friday. I know it's the same time as the program reports are due as well, but um, please work on that. That is priority. If you have to choose between the reports and this, I'd say go with this first and then reports can be submitted after. We really want um, to receive these grant surveys by then so we can um, focus on letting you know your intent to award information um, um, for the next program year. And so it is imperative that it is turned in by end, day, end of day Friday, okay? Um, and then last but not least, I uh, am going to ask you all, please, I'm going to also put another survey in the chat box function. Please, someone um, from your agency today, please go click in uh, and complete your survey. It's just a survey to see how these webinars are going. Um, give us information on how it's going, what changes can we make, um, and what other ideas you have for us. And so please, someone go in and complete that for us. It would be great to get that information. And so as always, you will get access to the slide deck. This is uh, recorded and will be uploaded onto YouTube today and will be sent to you once it is complete. And I will send it all to you via email, okay? Thank you all so much for attending. Um, and uh, you all have a good rest of your day. Um, and that's all. Thank you. Well, Kimberly, don't hang up until I download all these links. Yes, I'm not going to hang up yet. What I will do is I will stop recording. Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.